Good evening and welcome. I'm Nicholas DiMancio, uh, department head here at MIT Architecture, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight and to welcome you to our spring 2022 lecture series. I'll start with our land acknowledgement. MIT acknowledges indigenous people as the traditional stewards of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which we sit tonight is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory. And we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people connected to this land on which we gather from time immemorial. We started with a land acknowledgement here at MIT Architecture last um, uh, in the spring of 2020. And the risk of such words, of course, is that they remain words. The best possibility, however, is that they shape our reality in daily practices. Offering them is not a substitute for action, but an important context for the action we must take. The intersection of words, actions, and places is, of course, also where this lecture series lies. Welcoming in-person visitors now back on campus here at MIT, as well as a continued engagement with remote audiences, and welcoming all of the above to our own intellectual home the intersection of design and research, exemplified in tonight's lecture as well. This semester, um, uh, we will confront thermal dynamics in architecture, but also performance, globalism, uh, globalism and racialization, power systems, the climactic turn, the mythology of architectural authorship, and the complex relationship between people, place, and building. Through it all, we seek architecture's role in helping us understand the world and its responsibilities and possibilities in transforming it. The series is a collaboration between the diverse faculty, staff, and students of MIT's Department of Architecture, which includes architects, designers, urbanists, historians, critics, theorists, artists, social entrepreneurs, experts in computation, and, as tonight, in building technology. Alongside these academic programs and public events, our student-run exhibits, publications, and platforms advance and shape our public adventure uh, agenda this semester as well, also adventure. Tonight's lecture is hosted with our Building Technology Discipline Group, collaborators in everything with us, from our core MRC curriculum to pathbreaking research in sustainability to advocacy and intelligence in ensuring that our new home in the Metropolitan Warehouse is the laboratory we need for a post-carbon future. With much appreciation, then, let me introduce, is it you, Christoph, giving the introduction, Christoph Reinhardt, the head of the Building Technology Group, to, give to, uh, to introduce tonight's speaker. So thank you so much for joining us, and welcome. Uh, thanks a lot, Nicholas, for the really kind words that you always have for building technology. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm so excited to talk to a room of faces and uh, see, I'm sure, the enthusiasm for uh, the, tonight's lecture speaker on your faces in a little bit. Um, as Nicholas said, uh, my name is Christoph Reinhardt, um, and I, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Professor Dorit Aviv from uh, Penn Design, where she's an assistant professor. Uh, she heads a lab there, the Thermal Architecture Lab, which at MIT we are all in love with labs. So uh, um, uh, I congratulate you for organizing your work together with students uh, in groups like this. This is wonderful. The Thermal Architecture Lab is a cross-disciplinary laboratory at the intersection of thermodynamics, architectural design, and material science. I first uh, heard about uh, or came across um, Dorit's work in a fabulous paper where a group developed a system in Singapore where they used a cooling panel uh, which uh, uh, some special um, layering structure, I'm sure we're going to hear more about of this, was designed so that we don't have any condensation but we can still radiatively cool uh, the um, people which are in a room which is like a bus stop or so. So it's a really ingenious way which really only somebody that has a deep understanding of thermodynamics can design material structures but also an appreciation how people in architecture will experience a space. So I was really taken by that paper looked everything up I could find about it, and I wanted to uh, learn more from the person who came up with this. So a really warm welcome. Um, 
Uh, Dorit is also has won a Holcomb Award for Sustainable Design and Construction for another prototype of passive cooling in a desert climate. She holds a PhD from Princeton in architecture as well as an AMARC degree um, from Princeton as well. Uh, has practiced for various firms from Todd Williams, Billy Cien Architects to KPF and Atelier Raymond Abraham. And uh, she works a lot on installation, is, uh, was a participant of last year's Venice Biennale and co-curator of the Energy Pavilion in the 2017 Seoul Biennale for Architecture and Urbanism. Please help me welcome Dorit. Thank you so much, Krista, for the introduction. It's really wonderful to be here at MIT. Um, I see some familiar faces, um, and um, it's, it's uh, great to be a part of your lecture series. Um, so I want to start uh, by explaining the title of my talk, Thermal Architecture, or what it means to view architecture as part of the sphere of thermodynamics. So what you see on the screen right now is what I call a thermal space. It's a representation of the interior volume of a building created through a combination of 3D scanning and surface temperature detection. The resulting mesh is therefore a hybrid between the geometry and the thermal properties of the room and its objects and the people emitting their heat to their environment. But I want to argue that it's a representative of how we should think of architectural space in general if we view it as part of the world of thermodynamics and vice versa. Thermodynamics is integral to what architecture is. Since architectural surfaces and interior volumes are sites of constantly evolving thermodynamic interactions, and in fact, all architecture is thermal architecture. And the most basic role of architecture is to manipulate the exchange of heat between people and their surroundings using materials and geometry. This goes to the question of conception of geometry and space. So let's start with volume, which is probably the most important architectural geom geometry medium of modern architecture. The perception of the interior space of a building as a void, the inverse of matter. Here to the left, let's see if I can get my cursor there. All right, here to the left, um, you can see a plaster cast by Luigi Moretti from 1952. Um, it's, it's off of the interior of a Baroque church. And for me, it's, it's exemplifying um, exactly what interior volume is for modern, modern architecture. It's the inverse of matter, and we can fill it with a cast because it is voided space defined by the material around it. And it's shown here as homogeneous and static. But in fact, this interior volume is not a void. It is full of matter, and this matter is perpetually moving through space, as we can see in the fluid dynamic simulation to the right. And this movement is generated by temperature differences that stratify the matter into multiple layers. So the volume is heterogeneous, and it's in constant fluctuation. Similarly, the concept of the architectural surface shifts. In contemporary architecture, the surface has taken prominence through its domination of digital modeling tools where the representation of the architectural object is as surface geometry, autonomous and isolated in space. Actually, the only context that it has um, are the XYZ coordinates in, in the virtual space where we're modeling it. But from the perspective of thermodynamics, the surface is only one layer 
in a chain of environmental interactions. Surfaces radiate and exchange heat with all other surfaces around them, and these exchanges extend from the immediate surroundings all the way to the cosmic scale of the sky, outer space, and the sun. The reconsideration of architectural elements as active agents that interact with both internal and external environmental forces can provide our discipline with powerful tools to tackle some of the most pressing challenges of our time, the environmental crisis of climate change and that of environmental health in buildings. Now, you probably have all seen these statistics before, but to me, it's still mind-boggling every time I look at it to think that the building sector is responsible for 40% of energy-related greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that's more than industry, more than transportation. And building heating and cooling is about half of that. If we take a closer look at what building operational energy is made out of, Actually, cooling is the fastest growing energy use in buildings. Cooling energy demand is predicted to triple within the next three year, 30 years because of the expansion of air conditioning technology throughout the globe and because of global warming and population growth. To the right, you can see NASA's predictions for the summer temperatures in 2100. Where, the, where large swaths of the globe will experience extreme heat. We had a preview of it this past summer with the historic heat wave hitting the west of the United States and Canada. Temperatures surpassed 45 degrees Celsius or 115 Fahrenheit. And this extreme heat, this was actually a 1500 year heat wave, but you know, we know that's going to be more and more often. And this, in this extreme heat con situation, air conditioning could actually not be used in many regions uh, where the heat wave was hitting because um, the air conditioning was putting such high um, power demand on the power grid that there were a lot of blackouts. And this has led to a large number of cases of heat stress mortality. So we're trapped in this vicious cycle where the planet is warming and the warming is leading to the need for more cooling and the more cooling is leading to more energy related emissions and to more warming and so on and so forth. So what can we do about it? We can't keep using the same technology for cooling that we've been using for the past 60 years because it has brought us to where we are now. We need alternative cooling solutions. The other crisis that we have to address as architects is the environmental health crisis of, that was brought in buildings that was brought to the forefront by the COVID-19 pandemic because we live in closed environments that have become ideal sites for virus spread. So uh, here to the left, we have our current building cooling and ventilation design paradigm. We have, uh, it's a little hard to control the cursor. Um, we have our air handling unit, which takes in uh, fresh air, there you go, um, and distributes it centrally throughout the building, and then the return air, the uh, return air goes back into the um, air handling unit, and with a recirculation damper, most of it is actually recirculated back into the uh, supply air, and some of it is rejected outdoors. Um, and we're doing that in order to save energy, uh, because all that volume of air that needs to be distributed into the building has to be preheated or pre-cooled. And so um, this was a measure that was um, put into buildings to, to reduce the energy demand. On top of that, we create buildings that are really highly sealed 
usually, if we have windows in the room, uh, in, in many cases, they're not operable. Uh, they're only for view. Uh, to, again, this is a measure to, uh, and, 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 and everything is well insulated. Again, a measure to save energy, prevent in, air infiltration that would put additional um, uh, load on the mechanical system. Well, uh, you know, this is, maybe you've seen this image. It's actually from the New York Times, the one to the right here, um, where this is showing what is happening in a room where you have a sick person and all the windows are closed, how uh, the virus spreads. And uh, we've, all, we've all known this, that during COVID, the vast majority of transmission has happened indoors and that the buildings are sites of, of rapid transmission. So the problem is our design paradigm and um, the fact that we put energy savings and air and sorry, energy savings and air quality at odds with one another. And um, you know, this is due to the way we ventilate building and provide cooling. Now, during COVID, um, it's obviously become a problem so to recirculate return air back into the building because of the transmission risk. So ASHRAE came, ASHRAE, um, the, the body that uh, governs the standards for ventilation in buildings, released these new guidelines where they say wherever it's possible, go to 100% outdoor air instead of, and, and complete, completely eliminate recirculation. But this has huge energy implications because, again, um, so this is, this is, you know, the, if, if we go from what we do right now, which is 20, pre-pandemic, about only 20% of the um, air, supply air in buildings was uh, fresh air or outdoor air intake, and 80% is recirculated air. So in a re recent research that we published, uh, we looked at what that means for different climates for cooling energy demand. And so to the left here, you can see that in a climate like Boston, let's say, like where we are now, uh, that would result in over 200% energy spike in cooling energy to go from 20% to 100% um, uh, outdoor air intake. So, um, the, again, uh, like I said, the problem is the design paradigm of putting ventilation and, um, and, and energy saving in, at odds to one another. So a lot of my research focuses on ways to find alternative cooling solutions where fresh air, and, and fresh air supply and cooling can be achieved at the same time. But these solutions, unlike the air handling unit, have to be climate specific. So I'll show different solutions for different types of hot climates um, where you need cooling uh, for the hot dry climate and for the hot humid climate. And this is the first prototype that I want to discuss. It's an adaptive wind catcher, um, which is an integrated chimney that um, is part of a building's roof. It, com it combines evaporative and radiative cooling, and this project is in collaboration with Princeton and with the University of Arizona, uh, where it is actually currently, currently being tested in real desert conditions. So the, pic the picture you see to the left there is actually uh, during construction. Uh, the chimney is about 14 feet tall, just to give you the scale of it, and it is on a roof of a building in Tucson, Arizona, at the University of Arizona. And you can see it's, it's not complete yet. It's still waiting to receive the, the enclosure of the skin, but the top of it has already been installed. Um, now, what do I mean when I say deserts or desert climate? Well, in fact, deserts are already a third of the 
um, Earth's land surface, and they continue to expand due, due to global warming. But when I say desert, I don't mean um, empty land. I mean all these regions that are actually sometimes highly populated. And this prototype can actually work in semi-arid uh, climates too. So it has this wide range of regions around the globe where you can use this technology. Now, how it works, uh, it harnesses precisely the environmental forces of the desert climate to provide fresh air and cooling to building interiors. It uses the hot, dry air and the desert sky as means to employ alternative cooling strategies, usually reducing energy demand while maintaining occupant health through fresh air intake. The two cooling strategies deploy the evaporative cooling uh, creating a downdraft volumetric airflow and the surface-based radiative cooling from the, um, from the sky operate around a diurnal cycle. So this is the prototype initially tested in, la in the lab and its operation is as follows. During the day, the hot dry air of the desert is captured by the chimney's funnel shaped top. It traps the hot air which then moves along its surface where a hydrogel membrane is embedded. Hydrogel is a humidity responsive material. When saturated, it swells and passively diffuses water into the dry air, bringing down the air temperature through evaporative cooling. When the air cools, it drops down the chimney and into the building below due to buoyancy forces. A cycle of cooled air thus constantly ventilates the interior volume of the building. The chimney's envelope provides additional cooling through infrared radiation exchange with the desert sky. A special membrane with wavelength selective properties protects it from excessive solar gain during the day, but allows for infrared cooling by the sky. High thermal capacity liquids are stored in modules within the chimney's envelope and act as thermal mass. Radiant, the radiant temperature of the clear desert sky drops to below freezing during nighttime and provides free cooling to terrestrial surfaces through radiative exchange with the cold outer space. And this video is actually an excerpt from a video that was in uh, the Venice Biennale for architecture, as Christoph mentioned, um, I participated in that, uh, in, in the 2021 exhibition in the virtual Italian pavilion. And this project also recently won uh, a Holcim award. Uh, but to talk a little bit more about the research process for it, uh, these are some of the um, radiative cooling uh, um, experiments we've done with just model, um, modules, smaller modules on, on the roof in Arizona. And then here you can see the first uh, hydrogel um, uh, experiment that me and my uh, collaborator, Alethea Ida from University of Arizona, of Arizona we're, um, we're making hydrogel here. And in fact, I know this is, you know, no one is thinking twice looking at this picture, but this is actually pre-COVID. So we're not wearing masks because of COVID, we're actually, wearing them because during curing hydrogel, you know, the chemicals, you need to put on a mask. Although um, uh, once it's cured, it's actually completely environmentally friendly. Um, and this is a little bit more about the hydrogel and how, um, you know, it expands and diffuses uh, water. So we're looking into the uh, diffusion rate, et cetera. We're also looking at um, the chimney geometry and how to optimize it, uh, you know, and capture um, the right amount of air uh, for different applications. In fact, I'm currently working with Microsoft on this technology in relation to data centers. Uh, they're interested in how this can be applied to data center cooling. And data centers have become an important part of my work, and I'll explain a little bit more later about that. Um, but I want to go back to my previous point about finding alternative cool cooling solutions. What this adaptive chimney does is to 
create this um, downdraft cycle, providing fresh air to the building interior using gravity, right, buoyancy, and water-air interaction instead of big energy loads. And so moving from closed architecture system to an open architecture system where the fresh air intake is completely aligned with the cooling process. Now the other research project I'd like to share um, is uh, for the opposite climate, still hot, but very, very humid. And uh, you can't use evaporative cooling in this climate or sky cooling uh, because of the high humidity. So the, this project has a very different approach. And I, I worked on it uh, during my PhD in Princeton. So this was part of work uh, by the Chaos Lab in Princeton, but also in collaboration with uh, the University of British Columbia and ETH and Berkeley. And what we did here is um, in this pavilion that was built in Singapore, um, it's, it's made out of, and, and, and Christoph started explaining that a little bit, it's made out of radiant cooling panels. Um, and that's how you're providing cooling to people that are standing under this open air structure. But using radiant cooling has not been possible in the past in humid climates because radiant cooling relies on bringing down the surface temperature of, this, you know, of the panels. Uh, by here we're using this, um, you see in the blue, those um, water tubes and bringing them down to a temperature that in this climate would be below dew point. And what happens when you cool, cool a surface below the dew point or when you cool a surface in a very hot uh, and humid climate, right, you get condensation. But the surfaces of the panels did not, in, in this pavilion in Singapore, did not condensate. Even though the temperature went, of, of the water that we ran through it went much, much below the dew point. And why is that? Um, it's because they're protected and yeah, you can see that here. Um, this, this, uh, this colder surface at the back is protected by this membrane that acts as a vapor barrier. So this hot, humid air cannot actually touch that surface. And there is this um, dry cavity where the surface can be cooled. But what is special about this membrane is that it's infrared transparent. That means that you can still radiatively cool the person facing the panel. Um, so achieve cooling without condensation. And uh, you know, what does it mean to be infrared transparent? You can see that in the image where, my, um, uh, where one of the leaders of this project, uh, Eric Titelbaum, is standing here and he's holding this membrane. And you can see that in the thermal camera, you can see through, you can see his head and his hand, but in the regular picture, he's actually hidden by it. It's not in the, in the visible range, it's not transparent. And same thing here in this video. So what, what this means is, you know, why is this important? Well, it's important because we created the completely open air structure. Um, and we were still able to cool people and make them comfortable in the hot, sweltering environment of Singapore. And we didn't use any air conditioning. In fact, we didn't use any control of the air temperature, only of the surface temperature. And you know, this is a small pavilion, um, but it has implications in the building scale as well. It means that we can open the windows it means that we can use the surfaces of the building to provide cooling to people and let um, unconditioned air into the space, which effectively decouples the air that we breathe from the provision of heating or cooling to the space. Now, you know, probably you've heard many times that in a hot and humid climate, you can't open the window, you really need air conditioning. Um, 
because it's too hot, it's too humid. So doing this actually means uh, huge energy savings, and that's another thing we studied in, in this paper, um, which is what, what are the implications of, of applying that around the globe in different climates? And we realized that you can get up to 45% energy savings um, in certain climates coupling radiant cooling and natural ventilation, because you're essentially you're increasing your natural ventilation potential. And this image is from a recent book chapter that I uh, wrote about architecture post-COVID and emphasizing this idea that we need to design breathing buildings and that we need to th start thinking about archi the architectural surfaces, what makes the building itself you know, part of what, what is within the architectural realm into something active that can actually manipulate people's thermal sensation. Now, beyond, beyond this, I want to circle back to what I started with, which is the idea, that thermal, uh, the idea of, of a thermal space and how geometries and materials can activate our thermal senses. Now, in this pavilion, your thermal sensation is heightened as you're entering the space. You can see here in that gradient, right, you're coming from the hot, sweltering environment. And as you're walking in into this shaded space and you're surrounded by these cooled panels, all of a sudden your thermal sensation is radically changing. Um, and what you feel is not just relief, but even delight. Like my colleague here, <laughs> Adam Rizanek uh, from the University of British Columbia is also one of the leaders of this project who is enjoying this moment of walking in. He's sweating and he's hot and he walks in and what a relief, what a, what a pleasure to be surrounded by these cold surfaces. And in fact, what he's doing is in his body is ex exactly optimizing that relationship between the uh, geometry of the of the uh, surfaces and the geometry, sorry, <laughs> and the geometry of his body, um, you know, more exposure of the skin to the surface is better to get more um, thermal sensation, more heat flux. So, um, the, this idea of, of of heightening the thermal experience with contrast. Um, and creating thermal delight is something that, you know, I'm very interested in. And I love the way that Lisa Heshang, who, um, who uh, you know, wrote uh, the, the book Thermal Delight in Architecture based on her dissertation that she did here at MIT. I, I love the way she defines it. And I'll, I'll read a little bit part of her quote here. There's an extra delight to the delicious comfort of a balmy spring day as I walk beneath a row of trees and sense the alternating warmth and coolness of sun and shade. So this, this idea of creating these contrasts in order to heighten thermal sensation is something that I've also experimented with. And in, the, in this next research project, that's exactly what we were trying to do. Um, this is in the, uh, an installation in the Sol Biennale for Architecture and Urbanism for two, from 2017. It's part of the um, energy pavilion, which I co-curated with Forrest Meggers. And uh, what you see here is a thermal image of the space. And you can see the really high contrast between the cold and hot surfaces. And I'll explain in a second how we achieved this. But um, the temperature difference, as you can see by the uh, FLIR thermal image, are um, almost 20 degrees Celsius or 35 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a really big temperature difference. And the, you know, why, are we create, why are we doing it? Why are we creating it? The question that, that I was asking myself uh, when working on this was, how do we create a space which is not defined by the visual. You know, we're, we're architects. Uh, we're so used to thinking about space as defined by the, um, the visual boundaries. And I was asking myself, can we actually subdue the visual 
and make people think about what architecture is fundamentally doing as a thermal shelter, which is alternating people's thermal sensation. So here is what the space looks like with a non-thermal camera. Um, it's actually a maybe pretty boring space, um, or at least very repetitive looking. It's, it's this uh, long, dark tunnel made of uh, parabolic um, troughs. Uh, it's this extruded aluminum that uh, in each of, of these, I don't know if you can see that clearly here, but in each of these uh, aluminum parabolas, there's a black pipe in the center, and this actually wraps around space three-dimensionally. And what it's doing um, is, is this. So uh, that black pipe has alternating hot and cold water running through it, and the, um, the aluminum parabolas act as reflectors, and this is just like uh, light fixtures. You know, if you've seen parabolic light fixtures with um, a light bulb in the center and the, par the parabolic troughs would reflect light back on you down into the room. This is doing that with, with infrared light, right, which is uh, thermal radiation and directing thermal flux, radiant uh, fluxes back onto people that are walking through the space. And if you see the, the parabolas are alternating in where they're turning so that as you're walking through the space, you get this gradient of, it's a little bit too blurred in, on the screen here, but it's actually more contrast. But you get these this gradients and you're moving between the extreme of hot and cold and then uh, in, in the middle. And this is maybe an easier way of thinking about it. You're either turning your body is either perceiving mostly the, um, the, the, uh, flux, the, heat, the radiant heat fluxes from the cold pipes or from the hot pipes, depending on where you are in the room. And so um, this is, uh, you know, in order to give people a clue of what's going on, we actually placed um, thermal cameras on the two sides of the room. And here you can see the contrast in the surfaces between the two sides and, and the hot person. Um, now, what does it look like? Again, not very interesting to walk through that space uh, if you're just, uh, you know, you're only seeing um, what is there. But if you think about what your skin is seeing or what your skin is sensing, that's actually what is being revealed by this thermal image. And it's this contrast between hot and cold that are really heightening your thermal sensation, um, you know, activating your, your sensors and creating what we call this installation, which is a thermally alive space. And I think it's kind of magical. And so part of my work is, was actually to, you know, it actually started from this project, but I was, wanted to understand how our body was actually receiving those uh, heat fluxes in three dimension. So I started developing these simulation tools to look at the interaction between surface temperatures and surface geometries of people um, and you know, really understanding people geometry and surface geometry in a way that's much beyond what uh, conventional thermal comfort models are doing. But um, in fact, my work actually extends beyond the human and you know, in architecture school, we love to talk about the post-human so um, I'm also looking at the thermal sensation or, or thermal comfort of non-human objects, um, of machines, uh, you know, computers, and actually pre-human uh, natural objects like these fossilized uh, stamps in, uh, uh, that you see to the right. Um, I'll start with that project actually where I was tasked to design a thermal shelter to preserve uh, these stamps, which are, um, uh, they're part, you know, this is one stamp, but there's actually a whole forest of them. They're, 35, they're over 35 million years old, 
and they are part of the, the um, fluorescent national monument in Colorado. And the problem that they're experiencing is that because of the freeze-thaw cycle in this climate, they keep cracking. And you see to the right uh, the, the preservation efforts that are being done, really just you know, tying them together so they don't co continue to crack. Um, and the question that, that I was asked uh, together with my um, well, this, this came from the head of uh, preservation, the preservation department at Penn, Frank Matero, who works with the National Park Service. And uh, he, he um, asked me and, and my colleague at Penn, Masood Akbarzadeh, who's a structural engineer, to think about a lightweight structure that can actually provide this uh, temperature control for these stumps. And you know, there's a structural challenge there because you can see at the bottom um, the stumps are sitting in these balls, and uh, the, the, the ground around them cannot be disturbed. It has to be preserved as well. So there is about, it's hard to see, but there's like almost 20 meter span over there. And so you have to actually create this big volume and uh, keep the stump warm. And so our strategy is actually pretty simple to um, design a type of greenhouse and see if we can passively get the temperature ranges inside of the, um, of the greenhouse structure of this lightweight um, uh, wood structure to, below, to, to be constantly above freezing and at the same time avoid the temperature peaks during the summer, just opening it up and letting it natural, um, naturally uh, ventilate. Um, the, other, the other type of, of non-human uh, temperature control that I'm working a lot on right now is related to data centers. Um, now, you know, I don't know if uh, this is obvious or not, but data centers are this extremely fast-growing typology. It's, it's an architectural typology, and maybe we don't think about it or go visit it all the time, but it's, it's, you know, its footprint is growing exponentially. And more than the footprint, its energy footprint, its carbon footprint is growing exponentially. Um, so, and you know, according to the Department of Energy, they're about 50 times, they can be about 50 times more energy intensive than a regular office building. So, um, you know, I've been working now for a few years with both uh, Microsoft and Google on reducing energy consumption of data centers using, uh, you know, en low energy or passive cooling technologies. And sorry, I'm trying to get my cursor back. There you go. And this is actually um, something I've been doing with my students and in collaboration with other universities. So um, this is a, a booklet that Google funded where we did a collaboration between three different universities, the University of Washington and University of Arizona and Penn. And uh, we looked at, our students were uh, collaborating to design data centers that uh, um, are climate adaptive around different uh, climatic zones in the United States. And looking at uh, a place like Seattle where you can actually 90% of the time just use free cooling from the air, from the outdoor air. And then the idea here was to create this box with, that was in, essentially like a wind instrument that would um, optimize the airflow uh, within, within the data center or um, Another example of, um, again, in a, in a colder, even colder climate in Detroit, um, looking at how you can shape a building uh, to really using the, the um, wind flow to shape the building's interior and add buoyancy um, to really think about how the stacks and the landscape work together. Um, or in a climate that's much hotter here in Phoenix, the student project really, you know, 
is kind of like a termite mound where you're actually starting to use the thermal mass to protect the interior, but also again using buoyancy and here evaporative cooling um, to optimize airflow through the space. And they even design the whole racks of the data center again to think about our airflow. Um, it, it all goes back to the question though, you know, beyond uh, the specific questions of, of fossils or computers, et cetera, it's going back to this question of representation. And you can only start thinking about these things if you can communicate the relationship between building geometry, material, and energy flows. So this is part of like actually the early design process in the studios I teach where the students started looking at urban morphology together where here this is GIS based um, heat maps and looking how the uh, building form is actually related to the heat island or uh, look, you know using both um, uh, CFD simulations but also um, physical test in wind tunnels, looking at the volumes of air that are created exactly by the building geometries and thinking how that can be the first step into design is understanding those microclimates. And then also thinking about how you can actually create microclimates with design. Here again in a hot climate, can you uh, use um, the materials and vegetation and the geometry to change the uh, perception of heat, both in the indoor and the outdoor, outdoor environment. So this all goes back to the idea that, um, you know, that I started with, which is we have to stop thinking about architectural objects or architecture as objects that are isolated in space. Um, but rather, we have to start thinking about them as mediators of heat and airflow. And um, that, in fact, all spaces are thermal spaces, sites for constantly evolving thermodynamic exchanges. Thank you. Okay. That was this one? Yeah, perfect. This was, that was uh, absolutely fabulous. And uh, we want to give everybody an opportunity, both when you are um, participating online as well as in the room, to, um, to ask your question. So the idea is we have a wonderful team. We have two of our doctorate students, Edo Gascon Alvarez and Nada Takam. Uh, kicking us off with two questions and then again if you're online please post them and we will file them here and when you're in the room excellent you get rewarded asking a question and so that everybody can participate please go to the microphone over there to ask your question and with that any of the two who's gonna get started Thank you, Dord. That was a wonderful presentation. Enjoyed the human and non-human, both of them equally. Um, so uh, the first question uh, I have is, um, so in reference to your radiant cooling projects, um, it's evident that switching from an air-based conditioning model uh, to a radiant-based one requires a paradigm shift for both you know, building users, consultants, and designers. Um, uh, you know, a paradigm that understands that large volumes of air can be exchanged without affecting the energy demand, but also that the notion of comfort isn't just a singular uh, temperature, you know, like you talked about thermal de delight. Um, so in your opinion, uh, what are the necessary next steps to ease this transition towards, you know, increased adoption? Um, how does your current and future work address that? Um, and what are the biggest barriers? Um, so. It's a big question. <laughs> That's Thank actually you. a great question. I actually just um, started working on, on research exactly about your question of what are the biggest barriers to um, adoption of, of these new systems because when, uh, when we published that paper that, that I showed about the potential energy savings of doing that around the globe, you know, there was a lot of interest. Uh, we, we were interviewed by journalists and they were, they were all asking this question, 
if this is you know, working so much better, why don't we see this everywhere? And uh, you know, can this actually, is this, can this be applied? What, what is keeping it um, from being widely adopted? And so that actually made me think about that very deeply. I think there's a lot of barriers that are you know, from um, economic barriers to cultural barriers to um, you know, knowledge barriers of like, how many people know that this is an alternative, right? To uh, owners, you know, the, because these systems are not that uh, prevalent, then there's, uh, uh, you know, owners, uh, will they take the risk to start a system that the mechanical engineer doesn't necessarily know how to, you know, promise them the, um, the exact, uh, uh, performance uh, that, that air conditioning systems do. They have a different control system. You actually have to assess the radiant temperature instead of the air temperature, right? When we, and we are also used to thermostats being the thing we live by in building control systems. So yeah, so there's all these different barriers and I'm actually you know, starting to talk to multiple stakeholders on what, are, what is kind of the policy steps we need to take in order to implement this more widely. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dorit. Um, as Nada said, I enjoy a lot of the presentation and, and it was beautifully kind of <laughs> transition from one project to the other. I, bit of a follow up from Nada's question. I, I, focusing a little bit on the, on the tools we use for simulation, I, I've always wondered like how at, we have this energy, very complex energy simulation software that at the end the output is the single number, which is very compact. And all of the projects show how we have to understand these dynamics and you clearly understand them and you use them for your work, but for someone who might not be that used to it, how, how do you think, how important do you think it is for, for designers, for architects, or whoever are using these tools to understand, to have an output of, or a kind of a dialogue with these dynamics and, and Yes, how, what, maybe a little bit in the same <laughs> narrative of what are the barriers and how to move forward with, with, this, with the tools. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question and question that I ask myself a lot. I mean, you know, um, and, and it's the question of um, what, you know, how, again, I think I tried to talk about the fact that energy flows are, are these non-tangible, right, uh, um, forces and the, you know, as designers, you're, you're working with form and you're working with materials and talking about energy flows. Uh, when it remains in the abstract, it's very hard to start intervening on that. So I think like rather than staying, you know, in the um, energy modeling mode only, understanding actually the, the, the um, geometry of heat transfer, because it has, you know, the physics of it also has a geometry, which is actually material dependent. Mm -hmm. And being able to visualize that, that's the first, first point where you can start interacting on that, right? Everything is simple from, we understand that um, if we are exposed to the sun, we get hot. And if we can put a surface here, that you know, is between us and the sun, then there, we stop that energy exchange, right? And then that's like you know, a very simple intervention on an energy flow, but it's actually, you know, that becomes intuitive for designers, right? That shading systems. So if we can start um, creating actually, like, you know, that's why I, I, I keep emphasizing the, the, the need to, to visualize some of these um, forces if we can start doing that and we can make them really, you know, relatable, um, then, we, then, you know, designers can start feeling like this is a realm I can intervene in. So I, I, I agree with you. I think the EUI is, is, uh, is not something that, you know, you give to architects and they can immediately know what do I do with that, right? But if I, if I, um, show them, okay, the, the, this volume shapes actually the way that the air flows. And if I make it taller, then there will be more buoyancy, right? That's, it's, it's all about uh, the geometry then. Fantastic, anybody in the room have a question? Please uh, go to the microphone and ask your question. Do we have any question here? 
Lucy, perfect. While Lucy is getting settled, I think it's actually perfect to use uh, data centers because computers don't complain, they just die. And so if we try it out and see that the computers uh, survive, then the multiplication factor is probably a lot higher than if you yeah. have the same with your occupants. And they also like, you know, they don't, they don't complain about humidity because they don't sweat. Yeah. So actually, you know, Maybe it's not very intuitive, but their comfort range is actually much wider than people. And uh, you know, that's something that uh, technology companies are also testing. What is that? How much can we uh, you know, stretch that range and still like, make the machine survive? All we care is that they actually keep working, right? We don't, we don't care if they're, you know, no one is asking them to rate their comfort level. Not yet. <laughs> we'll see. I guess my question, I don't know, is this working? Uh, I guess my question would be, um, I, I'm curious about the form of your, uh, the wind tower design. So is that from fluid dynamics or like is it optimized, like in which way is it optimized? Is it optimized to get more flow from the outside or like to have more buoyancy? So like I just want to know how did you come to that uh, elegant tower? Right, so yeah, the, the shape of the, of the tower itself I guess it's actually, you know, pretty pretty basic kind of um, hyperbolic form, and it's just about the transition from vertical to horizontal. Uh, you know, you get you get uh, um, less uh, 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 you get you, you get less uh, losses if you have um, a smooth transition uh, in from horizontal to vertical. But the the height of it, the the width of it. All of that is is determining the amount of air that can like it's like a pipe, right? So the amount of air that can flow through it, and then the interesting thing is like actually the top part, because that is both like acting as a wind catcher, right? So that um, it it channels air downward, but also a lot of what we're doing right now actually in the simulation realm is uh, playing around with that surface that has the hydrogel in it, because hydrogel. The, the whole thing about it is that it's, it's a surface, right? It's actually turning a surface into a, a, a surface of water, right? The, the, um, the water just diffuses passively from the uh, surface of the hydrogel into the drier air. So as you increase the surface, you increase the amount of evaporation. You can actually start playing with the geometry of that surface and have more surface area that the air has to go through to increase the amount of evaporation. So yeah, I mean, that, that is actually something that we're working on right now. And the geometry of that is actually uh, really interesting. And you can, you, know, you can get into all these things of like, how large it has to be to create the right boundary layer so your flow is more, um, is more uniform and how much, how much uh, surface area you even need in order to get to the right temperature range, which would also give you the right uh, uh, amount of buoyancy you need to get to the airflow rate that you need. Um, a quick comment or a question on the conveying of those qualities. But you had m multiple points in the presentation where you talked about thermal delight and uh, kept introducing the sole pavilion as a boring space, right? But really look at those explanations right, that depict the actual experiential uh, delight and also contrast, right? So, and then going to the renderings of the studio, which were really stunning visually, but also rely a lot on the blue and uh, red arrows right, to sort of convey the visual, visually the drama of an experienced, ultimately intangible, you described it very uh, well and nicely and very vividly, right, in different facets. And I think that's, I'm curious about how you perceive the forward, going forward, the struggle of conveying these qualities and relying so much on the visual, which is ironic in a sense because the thermal is operating in, in the same way through rays, right, but isn't visually, optically, in a sense, impactful to us, right? and how you basically address that and, and sort of, yeah, push forward the representational dilemma in that, right, to, to capture those qualities, maybe non, like, pixel visual, right, or false comer, co color, but also, yeah, the, the delight part, right, so I find that very intriguing, and if you have some more 
um, comments on? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's a real struggle, right? Because, you know, between the arrow to the gradient, that's, that's what we have, right? It's, um, and we started, you know, we're so used to seeing now thermal images that we start thinking that, you know, temperature is color and that uh, red is uh, hot and blue is cold, et cetera. Um, I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm struggling with those questions and this is maybe the part of the creative things that I am trying to study together with my students in the studio is that, you know, every time we come up with this question of how do you describe a thermal space and, you know, how do you, how do you visualize that or, you know, use other forms of representation to make that accessible. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think um, there's probably a range to explore there, um, but um, this is actually something I'm still struggling with, but also enjoying that struggle because as you're, as I'm asking those questions, you know, new, new creative solutions are, are coming out. All right, so the live stream question is, uh, many of your projects are situated in different climates with different cultures. Across these projects, do you find that people share a common definition of thermal comfort or discomfort despite having different cultural backgrounds? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, I haven't, uh, you know, done myself a lot of, uh, you know, survey-based uh, thermal comfort studies, but there are really, uh, you know, a great, great amount of research on that question. Um, and uh, actually, you know, one of the things I ask my students to read is uh, um, Tui Chang's work on thermal comfort, and he works on uh, thermal comfort in relation to colonialism and how, you know, thermal comfort technologies are uh, brought to, uh, you know, colonial settings and, and changing the architecture there. So, you know, there's, yes, like, you know, we actually associate thermal comfort with air conditioning to a great extent. And so there's like this importation of technology and, um, and culture in a sense together. And, you know, thinking about what even the clothing people have are different in different places, the architecture and how it manipulates thermal comfort could be different. And going into like this, this um, regime of air conditioning in all around the globe is what really, you know, is again, that's actually that expansion is what's causing that energy spike in, in, um, in uh, cooling. Um, but, you know, there's also obviously all these differences even between men and women, right? Then I think there was like a big article in the New York Times about that, the thermal comfort of, of men versus women uh, or, you know, different genders and, uh, and the fact that, that um, the thermal comfort, um, all the initial models were designed for men in suits sitting down in an office, right? So there's all the, I, I mean, I think to the question, there are all these cultural entanglements that are related to the thermal comfort field that really should be acknowledged. And there is a lot of research on that. Hi. Thank you for that. That was great. Um, I have a two-part question, which I hope is not um, too kind of uh, uh, mundane. So, as as you uh, as you know, I'm I'm a lowly facade consultant, so we work with things like uh, mineral wool and, and XPS and that sort of stuff. Um, and hydrogel is really interesting. I mean, it's obviously kind of expensive to use at scale still, but also, as far as I knew at least, and you might know better than me, it 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 needs rehydrating, right? Mm -hmm. At at some interval, so. My first question would be, um, is there, are there viable solutions for that? Um, and the second one, sort of related, um, are there ways of harnessing the, the kind of condensation from the dew point system to rehydrate the hydrogel? Yeah, so yeah, you're completely right. In, in the, um, the desert climate uh, prototype, 
it's an active system in the, in the sense of water is constantly being pumped into um, that top surface. Um, the, you know, which is actually very low energy, it's just a very small pump. Um, but the challenge there is actually, you know, we don't want to waste water because it's desert climate. It means there's not a lot of water there. So um, what we're also working on is, uh, rec you know, water um, recapturing system at the outlet. I haven't gotten into that, but that's actually an important component because otherwise with evaporative cooling in this type of climate, you're creating another environmental problem. You solve the energy problem, you're getting all this free cooling, but then you don't want to waste all this water. Um, so yeah, so actually hydrogel, you know, in, in certain states um, can actually act as, um, uh, uh, you know, medium to absorb water from the air. Um, so we have that as a, the outlet in order to not waste all this water. Um, and then I think the second part of your question about, you know, can you use, uh, can you use a system to, to rehydrate it, right? I mean, that's, that depends on the climate. Um, the problem in a hot, dry climate is that the, you know, the vapor in the, in, in the ambient air is so low Right. that there's not a lot of water to capture, so it's extremely challenging to capture from that. But in uh, more humid climates, you can actually, uh, or, or climates that actually go between uh, humid and dry uh, around the diurnal cycle, you can do exactly that. You can capture water during the high humidity, low temperature um, periods and release it during the dry periods. Okay, I don't want to hog the whole evening here, but I'd be curious to know also if you need to break the vacuum seal of the hydrogel for that, because it needs to be kept in vacuum, is that right? No. Or no. is that just aerogel that's true for? Right, I mean, the hydrogel is just exposed to the oh. air. Yeah. Okay, well then I take that back, thank you. Let's continue the, to be equitable, we then have two online questions. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, Dory, thanks. It was a, it was a great talk. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts about, oh, I guess, thermal comfort that's more at the scale of, of the human in the room than the room itself. So, you know, Heshong's ther thermal delight, as you know, has examples of that. The, uh, um, well, in this country or in Europe, the, the, the fireplace where the room is cold, but the, the radiant effect is warm, and you sit in the wingback chair, and you're comfortable. You wouldn't be if you move, but in, locally you are. Um, you've talked a lot about radiant cooling, and, 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 and we talked about humidity, um, but I, I know your work has also paid some attention to, to airspeed, I mean, the work with uh, the gang at Princeton and Singapore and so on, and, and that can be local. You know, the desktop fan, the little USB plug-in fan, so you're conditioning the person and, and not the room. So for the radiant cooling, which is what, what I'm interested in, I, I, I love the pavilion, but it, it's, uh, it works in part because all the surfaces, uh, as you know, are cool. And if you have windows or bookshelves or floor, then, then that, the surfaces that are cool have to be cooler and so on. So do you see, it, at the personal level, do you see room to look at the radiant cooling more or less as, as the cold analog to the fireplace, or the sun, which uh, um, can either be pleasant or 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 not, depending on on, uh, on 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 temperature. So, do you do you think the radiant cooling can be can be adapted in a way that that um, um, well, in effect, now it is cooling the individual because there's nothing else to cool, but that it could be used in 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 different room settings or leaving more options for the just for the, the structure of the room. Yeah, and I, I love the analogy to the fireplace, but this is um, actually, I'm working um, again collaboratively and also with um, uh, EPFL in Switzerland. I'm working exactly on that question and we're doing a study of, of uh, using radiant cooling for local comfort and what is the range and what is the you know, optimal arrangement where you can, because, you know, it's, it's also in the end also an energy balance, right? You can, 
if, if yes, the pavilion exactly was trying to optimize the view factor of the person. So you're completely surrounded by cool panels um, and you're completely shaded from all the hot surfaces around you. So what happens when you have this heterogeneity in space? Um, so of course, if you decrease the panel's temperature, even if you have a smaller view factor, it would still, you know, you can still get to comfort, but then you're starting to spend too much and you know too much energy on cooling. So we're working on like, you know, how do you find that you know optimal relationship between the you know the view factor and the, the temperature that can still get you to where you need to be. Um, so yeah, that's and, and, and I, I do think you know the advantage of using a radiant cooling panel is that it is something that can be quite close to a person, especially when you're sitting. You know, you can actually design spaces with active surfaces. Um, I mean, we have radiant floors and radiant ceilings, but you can also have vertical uh, active surfaces. And what's nice is that it can actually be close to the person and you don't need to then condition like huge volumes of air, right? So there, you know, I think the potential is, is definitely there, but what are the limits of that? when you have a hotter environment and how much can it actually differentiate from the air temperature and still be effective because, you know, actually the, you know, as you're increasing the difference from the air temperature, you also get more convective losses. So yeah, there's a lot to study there, but we're definitely looking into that question. Thank you. Okay, we have another question from the virtual audience. This is from Peter Lazowskis. He, he's asking, how would the specific geometry and massing of, say, a typical office building have to change to allow for effective natural ventilation and radiant heat and cooling? Can you repeat that? I missed part of the yes. question. How would the specific geometry and massing of, say, a typical office building have to change to allow for effective natural ventilation and radiant heating? Okay, or cooling? so, um, yeah, you have to have operable windows, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which actually, you know, a surprising <laughs> amount of buildings don't have, you know, it's, um, um, you know, that's actually a big issue for debate right now. People are talking, mm -hmm. it's, it's become something that like, you know, people are starting to talk about is should we really after COVID stop designing buildings with windows that don't open. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of, and, and I think, you know, maybe this is a little bit, if I understand the question correctly, it's about the retrofitability of, of buildings for these systems. And the nice thing is that these systems actually take much less space than ducts do, right? Mm -hmm. So if you already have that plenum space for ducts, it means you can easily have just pipes and, and radiant ceiling mm -hmm. implemented. Right? The floor is, you know, we all know what radiant floors are like, mm -hmm. you, you know, maybe that's a little bit harder, although not impossible. A lot of buildings are being retrofitted, retrofitted with mm. radiant floors. But in terms of space, you know, the nice thing is that it, they actually take less space, mm. not more space. And then you still need to worry about where is the air coming from, because if you stop providing the air from ducts, you really need to think about, do you get enough air from outdoor or increasing their velocity with just low energy fans in mm. the room? Any question in the room? Well, I have a question for you. Um, maybe here, since you're the expert on how to tweak the temperature of surfaces, right? Uh, typically, we've been taught to keep the delta T's really low so people don't notice the HVAC system. But I mean, the point of your architecture is that it should be more in your face, literally, and you should experience this. So maybe if people here want to experiment with that, what's the delta T you would say when people notice? Because most people walk through world, the world and don't notice anything, right, except for their iPhone. <laughs> and uh, so what, what creates a, a friendly kick that they say, wow, this is different? You know, I think the answer would actually have to be in watts rather than in temperature. Okay. Because, um, and I don't have the watts answer, but <laughs> but the issue is that you know it's it's all about because it's all about heat transfer, right? Yeah. So it's the amount of of heat that your skin is going to receive, and that's you know that's going to if 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 the 
um, exposure to the cold surface is only happening for a second because you're walking through it. Yeah. Even if the surface is super cold, you're not gonna, your body is gonna, you're not gonna notice the change very much where it takes like a few seconds for you to stand in the, even in that pavilion, right? And then really enjoy that um, radiant exchange. Um, so, um, so yeah, I think, um, it, you know, and again, it, it also goes to the question of view factor. If you're surrounded by surfaces, you can actually keep the temperature pretty high and still get that uh, thermal sensation impact uh, which is the great thing about, you know, that's where the efficiency of radiant systems come from, is that you don't need to use the very cold or the very hot uh, coil in order to get the air to the right temperature. You can actually use temperatures that are very close to comfort for the water temperature. So you're saving a lot of energy with that, right? And you can use um, low energy heat sources like geothermal, et cetera, to get to those, to the right temperature. So, I think, you know, I'm not really answering your question, Krista, but, um, but, you know, the answer is it's really kind of a combination of, of, the, um, of the surface, the geometry, the amount of surface you're exposed to, um, and the time you spend in front of it, um, and the temperature together that's going to determine your thermal sensation rather than just the delta T. I think that was a super MIT answer because you told me to calculate it myself, uh, uh, which I think is very appropriate. Uh, so in that, in your exhibition space, uh, what were the temperatures there? Because I felt a bit, you t when you take a picture, you notice these differences, but how long did people have to stay there? Like you had, a, probably you had hundreds or thousands of people shepherding through, did you say you have to stay here for 30 seconds, otherwise people don't well, notice anything? We asked them to take off their, um, to take off their jackets <laughs> uh, so that more of the skin is exposed. And we, you know, that's, so the challenge there, and Axel uh, visited, so he can tell you about his experience walking through the space. But, um, it, you know, so first of all, like, you know, the more amount of skin exposed yeah. is better. Um, but you know, that's because it's not such a large space and it's kind of this installation, people standing and looking, they weren't walking very fast and there's also not room for too many people to walk in at the same time. So, but we, yeah, the, the idea there is to try to optimize the view factor really to get to that. And it's really those moments where you're, uh, kind of pausing at the, at the end or in the beginning where you really feel that contrast. If you walk fast through that space, you actually won't, you won't really experience the gradient as much. Makes total sense. Any questions online or Nicholas? Sorry, I, I was super interested in the previous answer because you were talking a lot, you know, one, it, one really interesting thing about the history of technology is like the history of evolution is systems are dependent on other systems. So bicycles look the way they do, not because they're the best, but because we started building bicycles that way and the whole industries, you know, uh, 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 came up around bicycles that are shaped like a diamond. So in terms of, you know, the, related to your question about colonialism and the, the, or the, 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 which was also a really interesting discussion, there are all these systems and industries in the world based on a certain model of heating and cooling. And it's one thing to say from first principles, if we did it completely differently, it would all be great, but quite another thing to imagine how we get here from there and evolve one thing into the other. So I, I was very interested in your explanation of the possible use of plenum spaces for et cetera. And I was wondering if you could expand on that as you have throughout the conversation a bit, a bit more in a larger theoretical way. Like how do you transition buildings from and a whole set of existing buildings from one to the other versus imagine beautiful imaginary buildings from scratch that would be perfect? Yeah, that's a difficult question. Um, I think, I think um, the, you know, I come into this realm as, you know, from being first an architect that then started like being really interested in he transfer in the relationship between them. So on one hand, I'm, I'm you know, fascinated by this question of, of just how do you design with, with, this, you know, with this 
knowledge and with the physics of heat transfer and you know how do you create new designs but I think your to your question it's the real impact you can make is actually by modifying existing spaces and you know we're all starting to think right now also about the carbon footprint uh, the embodied carbon and working with existing buildings makes so much more sense than starting from scratch so you know the the chimney for example i get asked a lot you know can this really be in, uh, applied in different uh, in, in existing buildings? Do you really need to shape the whole roof, build a building from scratch? And the answer is no. Actually, you know, you can build an evaporative cooling chimney in, you know, as long as you can make a hole in the roof and, and, and uh, feed it in, you can make, as long, in, if you're in the right climate, you can add that in any building and the question of its effectiveness would just be the scale so, you know, it's just like having a, a chimney for a fireplace in a building and you can actually even think about retrofitting that. I mean, you have to think about the amount of airflow you get, etc. But, you know, there's each of these technologies actually has that potential for being adapted into existing buildings. At the same time, I think, at least pedagogically, it's also interesting to really think of what would be an ideal building and how would you start if you started now? And that's why the data center example is something that I like working with students on is because for them that's like, you know, a really energy intensive building typology that's not really architecturally defined yet because it's been emerging and proliferating throughout the 21st century. I mean, it existed before, but this is the century where we're relying on cloud computing. Um, increasingly. So there is still this room to invent and, and rethink the typology, which is, I think, really exciting as an architect. Great. Thank you so much for a fascinating uh, talk and this uh, really interesting discussion. I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about um, the tools that you use to produce your work and, and simulation more broadly. I come from a, a similar world, but um, structural engineering side, and there's a lot of debate about whether architects and designers should use tools that simulate structural behavior, because maybe they'll use them wrong and get, <laughs> get a really bad answer that they then think is validated by a simulation. Um, and then the other challenge is just how do we use these tools? They're not designed to be used for kind of the beautiful types of work you're doing. They're designed to be used kind of in this much more black box way and sort of a one-way linear process. Um, so they're slow and the inputs are complicated and the modeling assumptions are complicated. Um, or maybe I'm wrong in your field. So I'm curious, is that true also for the tools you use? How, how do you help students overcome that? Um, what do you see as the dangers, if any, of simulation? Um, where do you think it's going? Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, like here at the building technology at MIT, you, you're really a lot of your work is about making this tool more accessible and, you know, something that, that architects can actually use. And um, so, and which I think is really important because uh, there's this, you know, this gap of, oh, I don't know how to operate in that realm. And by making this tool accessible, that's the first step to making people feel like they can actually take charge or have agency. I think that, you know, there's this lack of agency in, in uh, the design discipline is a huge issue, especially with climate change. Like, can we step away from like that figure of 40% um, of the world's like global emissions that are energy related and say, hey, architects are not responsible. Like there's someone else designing the mechanical systems. Uh, I, I believe no, I believe like we have to step in, but in order to do that, you have to make some of these tools accessible and so that, you know, that there is more agency. But I also agree that uh, there is this danger of, hey, I, I got this, you know, thing out of this black box and it tells me that I'm doing something, so this is how it works and it makes no sense. So, you know, the way I try to approach it is to just, like, 
especially in teaching, is to teach both the first principles and the simulation tool and you know, try to make students critical of the simulation results and think about, does that make sense? And you know, is this what you're expecting? And if not, you know, rethink it and, and you know, just not accept. I mean, I totally agree. When you accept the simulation as, as, as your new you know, um, form of uh, this, you know, this is the standard I have to go by. This is my guideline. Um, you, you're, you're going to end up with people like misinterpreting or just having the settings wrong. And the more complex the simulations get, the more it is likely to occur. But you know, there are things that are, you know, like, I mean, Christopher and I had this discussion about daylighting that is so, in a way, intuitive to architects, right? Like, architects use renderings all the time. And they can understand how light works in the space. And if they start like, understanding how can I quantify it and how can I actually think about it as, as something that I can manipulate in my design, then you know, that's not such a huge gap. And you can actually definitely see when things are not working correctly. I think it's much more problematic with other types of simulations. But it's a struggle, yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. Last call for question, even though given our love for com uh, computational tools, that's a perfect <laughs> closer. I was asked before we close the session, and thank you to just uh, thank you all for coming and to remind you that uh, join us again. Next event is a week from now on February 24th. Uh, we have Building, Unbuilding, a conversation with uh, Jolanda Daniels in collaboration with the Architecture and Urbanism Group. Right here in this room, join us. And after this announcement, I want to wholeheartedly thank um, Dorit for joining us. <laughs>